You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. We've got literally one road what separate, separates us from another estate. And we just started having some crazy wars with them. We would have shootouts like every other week. I'm, I'm not talking like little shootouts. There will be machine guns being let off. The bouncer got shot straight through his head. I was standing next to him with my brother. It's going right through his nut. And the first thing I've done, obviously, I've just walked straight over his dead body. I've been in Belmarsh myself for murder charges. Like, I've not really spoken to anyone about my murder charge or what I went to prison for. My brother's been in prison for two murder charges. It's only like a month ago, like, I wish I wasn't even here. Like, I was thinking, I don't even want to wake up in the morning. Why am I here? You know? So, so you do? Yeah, I was having them thoughts. I was having them thoughts, man. Your heads will be fried. Because you know what? My, my, the crime I went to prison for, what I got the, the 17 years for, it was on uh, Judge Rinder. On, um, he'd done Judge Rinder's Crime Stories Week. And it's not until I see um, the security guard's wife talking and in tears, you, you realise it affects a lot of people. But at the time, you don't. You're just thinking, quick 40 grand. I put my mum through hell. Getting the doors kicked in every other week, selling drugs or for armed robbery with armed um, please put my mum on the floor or put my little brother on the floor. My little brother's nothing like me. He's autistic, so to keep putting him through things like that, and I, I feel like I'm part of the reason why he is the way he is. My little brother don't, don't even come out of his room. Ben Marain. Today's guest, we've got Lewis Clark. How are you, brother? I'm all good, man. I'm so happy to be here, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's good to see you, brother. Fascinating story. Spent nearly 20 years in prison, robbing, shootings, lost family members and friends to murder, robbing banks with your dad. Like, it's pretty fucked up shit, if I'm honest, bro, but that is your life story and you're here to tell it. First and foremost, how are you? I'm good, man. I just got caught in the rain. I had my hair all done. It was actually <laughs> My hair was actually looking slick before I got here, like... Yeah. But you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm happy to be here, man. I'm thankful. How do you feel about telling your story? Do you know what? I'm I'm looking forward to, uh, every time I look at you on the gram, I feel, I feel like you're a genuine person, you know? Yeah, thank you, brother. So I um, appreciate co me coming on here. Really yeah, do. man, everybody deserves a chance to tell their story. Everybody deserves a chance to make changes, but it's all down to the individual, where you want to go in life and what you want to achieve. Like, it's, life is a tough fucking slog, man, and... We do make stupid choices, there's no doubt we'll, we'll clarify that as the interview oh. goes on, but that is life, we are who we are, but all we can do is try and be the best version that we can be today, tomorrow, and for the future, bro. But I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up, how it all began. Well, I grew up in uh, Battersea, South London. Um, grew up in, I've got a, like, a crime-related family, like brother and dad heavily involved in armed robberies and drugs. Dad spent most of his years in prison brother in and out of prison also for drugs um so yeah it's only i was only going to go down the same road as them you know i didn't know nothing else and i've not worked a day in my life you know i've always kind of grafted well that sort of graph anyway arm robbery wise and selling drugs it's only now i've been released i feel i need to make a change i have a daughter so i feel i need to make that change now you know yeah how were you at school without a dad um school was it was a difficult one um I'm not very good at reading and writing, and I thought I was kind of picked on by the um, by the teachers and that. Like, they would know full well I wouldn't know the answer to a question, so they would pick me out of the classroom and be like, uh, Lewis, um, what's the answer to this? I'd be like, mate, fuck off your mug. He, he clearly knows I don't know the answer, so I felt like I was picked on. Where we kept moving from, like, London to Surrey, then Surrey back to London, my um, my school was kind of interrupted, you know? Um, I got kicked out on many occasions. I didn't, I left school when I was 15 years old. I didn't leave with any qualifications. But, um, school was an enjoyable thing for me. I felt like I didn't really fit in with anyone. So um, that wasn't for me. Does that make you rebel straight away? Because you didn't feel and you, you weren't good at school, like you didn't know the answers to a lot of stuff. It becomes more pressure on you. It does. I feel like um, I learned so much more from one-on-one -on -one support. 
Whereas we're in a class of like 20 to 30 people. And I'll be honest, I copied the whole of my maths book throughout the whole of that year in school. I didn't know the answer to anything. I had a few friends who used to sit next to me. So I used to just copy all of their work all the way through. Yeah. And to, yeah, I don't, I don't get to take no exams or anything. How many years was your dad in your life for first 15? First 15? It's crazy. Um, or how many years was he out? I don't know. I'm f I'm I'm gonna be thirty six soon. I'd say my dad's done at least twenty of them in prison easily. Um he's still waiting on his parole now, which he should get. Thumbs up. Fingers crossed. Um But you know, one thing I'd say about my dad, like even even when he's been in prison the majority of my life, I've never gone without so there's been birthdays, Christmases. He would always make sure I get a birthday card or Christmases all the way up to us like sixteen. I'd get presents. Then after that, I had to uh, kind of just do my own thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Was he out much? Was he around you in the first 15 years in and out of school? And um, not really. Not really. He was in prison. He was in prison himself for like armed robberies. I know he had a 10 and a half when I was in, in through my secondary school years. And before that, he just finished a seven and a half. I think that might have been for a Hatton Gardens job. Um, and obviously, he's just got a life sentence on his last one. Mm hmm what was it like, like going to visits as a kid? Because I used to go and visit my uncles for, for, for as young as I can remember, man, like two, three, four. And I remember I used to always playing a lot with little toys and I enjoyed it at that time as a kid. But then obviously you go, oh, do you think how fucking deranged you actually were? Like, how did you, how was your visits? Um, my prison visits with dad, they was great when I was there, but the journeys to actually get to some of these prisons, like as you know, some of these prisons are far out. So your mum, dragging you on the tubes the trains the buses it, it's it felt like it was the whole day then the time i got to the visits i'd be happy to see dad and then i'll just fall asleep on the way home um dad used to draw, draw like draw me little silly pictures every week and stuff um i still got some of the pictures indoors and that you know he's he's, he's really dad my dad is really supportive like i love him to bits so i can't stress mm -hmm. that enough yeah he always used to push me to get a trade but if he's trying to push me to get a trade kind of the only thing i'd say dad you need to be kind of leading by example and you need to be working and then maybe i might want to do that also yeah it's like people try to get somebody to stop drinking or taking drugs while they're still fucking taking it it don't make sense it don't make any sense no. like, you can understand your dad try to do the right thing not doing the same mistakes he done but again like you say he's not leading by example you're only becoming yeah. a product to his environment I used, to, I used to look up to dad. I used to think he was Superman. You know, like when they come back with like wads of money and be like, Lou, you can keep all the fibers out of that one. I'd be like, touch. Um, I used to think he was Superman. I used to proper mm -hmm. look up to him and that, you know. But we've had some, like recently we've become a lot closer. Like I think he looks at me now and he regrets a lot of things. I can see it in his eyes. He don't say so um, that much. But what he's been saying over the last years, when we finish our phone call, be like, Lou, I love you. Whereas he wouldn't really say that as much growing mm. up. Whereas now I feel like something's happened now. And he's like, Lou, I love you, you know. Um, them words just mean so much to me now. Yeah, because doing the trade that he does, he's got to be cold hearted because he can lose his life at any moment. So you've got to be so cold towards the system, so cold towards life, so cold to letting anybody in, even your own kids. And that's so sad because mm. it's not, and I always say this, I interview murderers, bank robbers, drug lords, some of them are the nicest fucking people and I've ever sp spoke to and they're still so kind and they're always there to yeah. support me I'll be there to support them like, it's not necessarily a bad person because you do bad things it's, it's trying to understand why they made the choices that they made and you tend yeah. to see a lot come from broken homes a lot struggled in school where they felt like a loner that they felt left out so they had to act we do all have choices as well but I get that and understand there's always victims as well but it's fucking hard when because it's your father and you love him, other people say, oh, he's a bad man, What he's done this, he's done that, but you might not see that and they might not see that. Like, it's, it's so weird the way somebody can love someone, but yet somebody else can hate them. Yeah, exactly it's, that. When when I've been, I've been actually banged up with my dad. I've actually had him for a cellmate. And um, it's like he's built for prison. I've never, yeah. ever heard him moan one day about being in prison. Every day he will wake up at six in the morning. He's really annoying in the mornings as well. He'll wake up, he start whisking his tea and that. But why did you have to hit the spoon so hard on the cup when you're making a cup of tea? Like I'm pretty easy to get me to do it to me on purpose, but it got me in a good routine. But it's like every day I wake up, he'd be happy to be there. It's like it was a little break for him 
for a little while, you know. He'd enjoy it. What was his parents like? Um, I think his dad was really strict. My nan, my nan loved him to bits. I think he was my nan's favourite, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I don't really know my granddad. He died at an early age, so I don't really remember him too tough. Yeah. How is that for a father and son to be in the same cell? Did you ever look at that and think this is fucking wrong? Yeah, yeah, of course. But I think for him, it is harder for him. With me, it is all right. It wasn't as bad for me, but I think with him... I think people used to like probably asking questions. Oh, tell what, what are you doing in jail with your son? And that like, must have been hard for him to actually take mm-hmm. it, you know. Yeah, because all that, this is why I'll probably be telling you, he loves you. Like, everything comes to a head, everything comes to the surface where, wait a minute, this isn't right. And probably at that time, he's probably, you built a bond and a connection in a cell. Every day, like pranks. Like, I remember he made a hole in the bottom of my Coke can. He's leaked all my Coke out the bottom of the can. I was look, I was saving this can of Coke for match of the day. Anyway, he's filled it back up with water, managed to super glue the bottom of it somehow. I've clipped it, I was thinking, strange, it's not made no fizz. I started drinking. <laughs> I had my dad's on the other side of the bar on on his bed, absolutely in bits. I was like, Dad, you wanker. I was looking forward to that. He's like, I drunk it though. It's like, yeah, cheers, uh, Dad. How long Top did man. you say I sell with each other? Um, just over a year. We done the first I done my first three years in high down, but we done the first year together in the cell. Um, it was all good, but we needed our own space, as you do. As, a, yeah. as being a grown man, you need your own space. Yeah. Did you feel as if he's got a connection? Yeah. I think we started getting more of a connection because we met back up when we got to DCAT. So he's done his therapeutic side because he had to go to a prison called Grendon. So you've got to sit around like um, ex-armed robbers, murderers, um, even rapists. and yeah, All the nonces and that, and that. All the nonces and stuff. So you've got to sit around this table and you've got to listen to these guys' story. As much as you, you're not going to like him talking about whatever, it's hard for you to take. He had to do four years of that. Yeah. To put up with that. And then he come and met me in DCAT, gave him a big hug. Like I said, I missed you. And then he actually moved back in my cell again and he's back to his old antics, making cups of tea in the morning, making up all this mm-hmm. noise. Yeah, Grendon's a mad place because I'm good friends with old Razor Smith. I, 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 I know love, Razor. I love naughty bits, man. Like he changed his life and he says it was so hard to do that. Like people saying, why are you going there and this and that? But the guy changed his life. Now he's a book author and I fucking love the guy. He's just a good 100% loyal to the core man individual. No, no, it's proper. I think he done one of his first arm robberies with my dad. Are they? If I recall, yeah. Well, they've all been connected, haven't they? We, it? We, yeah. I met him at an old um, Blimmin' Rockers pub, actually, no. It was with my uncle John and my, my dad, obviously called Terry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we all met up at a pub and he gave me a book and just signed it for me and that. But I, said, I think all the armed robbery community, they're all linked up yeah. somehow. No came out of prison, never gave him any money. Just got a plastic bag out McDonald's, put it over his head and done a bank himself. Used to do banks himself. Yeah, he did. My yeah, bastard. Oh, he's he's, he's yeah. a nice fellow though. He's genuine yeah. now. No, Love him to bits, man. mate. Love him to bits. Is, uh, so what is, did you join a gang? Usually you tend to see a lot of people, father figures aren't there. You join a gang if you like a part of a family. <laughs> yeah. So um, with me, like the gang situation was a bit different. I was always, as a 14 year old, I started like selling drugs and I slowly started drifting into the gang sort of life because all my friends were about it and I think it's like early I'd say early 2002 you know all the way up until like 2010 um the gang was called G Street Old Tree One and where's 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 one of the biggest gangs in South London at the time and what was crazy for me like there wasn't many white guys about there's literally me and my brother and two other white guys around another hundred black fellas so we all used to stand up and I've always made decent money from a kid, like selling like green and stuff like that, you know? So I used to, as a kid, I used to have a stupid chain and bracelet. Absolutely ridiculous when I look at um, the pictures back now. It's really embarrassing and cringy. Um, but it all, it all starts with people hating on you, you know? So we've got literally one road what separate, separates us from another estate. And we just started having some crazy wars with them. We would have shootouts like every other week. I'm I'm not talking like little shootouts. There will be machine guns being let off. I should have brought some pictures with me. There's still dents in the do- these wooden doors where someone's jumped out and we've all had to hide behind a little concrete wall. All we can see is the smoke just coming out of the gun. Do, 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 do. It's, I've nearly died at least five or six times through shootouts. 
And probably the, the worst occasion I had was when my brother was actually shot five times and uh, my really close friend, there's both hit five times. Um, some Someone pulled up on a motorbike. Don't know who did it. Don't know what color the bike was. I was already on the phone. Once the first shot hit my brother, I was already on the phone to the ambulance. And I was like, uh, my brother's dead. Can you come and pick him up? Here's where we are. Because I was hiding behind a, a metal dustbin. But as I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I can see they got, they actually got off the bike and they continued to shoot my brother. So like the first shot got my brother in his Achilles and he was in his slippers at the time and it was summer, you know? And then all the other shots started going higher and higher up his back. Um, they had to leave a couple of the bullets in his back because it was really close to his spine. Um, my other pal was hitting the shoulder, his little finger. The poor fella had a broken leg at the time. I shouldn't laugh, but he had a, broken leg at the time he's been done twice in his poor broken leg but he's on a pushback so he's using one leg to roll because he's at a top of the hill he's managed to roll all the way down to the bottom of the state and then collapse but when the bike drove off that's when i run up to my brother i started stripping all his clothes off to see where he's been hit <clears throat> and then i've just laid on top of him and cover up like all the holes into like um the ambulance got there obviously the police arrived first the ambulance come after and um I knew he was half going to be all right because he's making stupid jokes. Because where I pulled his clothes off, he's got like um, a little growth on the in, um, on his groin and it looks like a Rice Krispie. And he's like, Lou, fucking hell, they're going to see the Rice Krispie on my leg. I was like, tell you just been shot five times, you know. And he's like, just go and take the money out the ass. All right, cool. Um, got everything sorted or whatever. But when I come back, it's like the, the police weren't interested. The first thing they said to me now is, oh, when are you going to go back over that side and do your thing now? So I said, fuck off, mate. So no, no, none of the boys got interviewed over it or nothing. The only thing I was, um, the only thing what caught me up in later years is um, it kept replaying in my head what happened. And um, I'm only started getting help for it now. But it's in the same location, like the bouncer got shot in his head. And these things just started to become normal for me. And I actually had to go on Google and Google these events. I'm thinking, am I, am I actually making these things up? Am I going mad? I've actually Googled these things. I was like, oh my God, I was actually there and it did happen. The bouncer got shot straight through his head. I was standing next to him with my brother. It's going right through his nut. And the first thing I've done, obviously, I've just walked straight over his dead body. The youngsters who were standing next to me because he was taking money at the door, they started going through his pockets. I'm thinking, these poor little fuckers have been nutted and you lot are going through his pockets. I'll run and jump behind the bar and that. A couple of people got hit in the legs and stuff. Um, but these things, are, they're slowly starting to catch up with me, but I'm I'm getting help, help with it now, you know? Yeah, do you get nightmares with that? Yeah, like sometimes, especially if motorbikes pull up next to me. I've done some crazy things where I've grabbed my powers like steering wheel if a bike pulls up next to me in the traffic lights and I've gone to mm -hmm. get them off the road and that, you know? yeah. Um, no, no one ever got nicked for it. No one don't know who done it or anything like that. So to this day, to this day. So um, the only thing I'd say to that is, I don't even want them getting nicked. Whoever done it, I don't even want you to get nicked. I, no. just, I just, want, I just don't want you to do, ever do that again. How is that though? Seeing your brother now, you think he's dead? Were you so cold to it that you thought? I felt just was, did you freeze or were you just in control? Of it? I was in control of it. Weirdly, I was really comfortable with the whole situation but it's caught up with me years later. Mm -hmm. Where I sat in the cell for so long, things were just replaying. And do you know what's funny? Me and my older brother have never sat down and we've never had that conversation about how he feels about that situation. Because he's been through the wars. He's been stabbed five times. I've probably been stabbed once. But I've ne we've never sat down. Like sometimes I think, let me phone my brother. Like I just want to cuddle him sometimes and that, you know? But I've, I've never I've never done that. Do you think you're getting softer as you get older? In a, in a positive way, though, but you're coming... I feel, I feel so. Yeah, well, you're, you understand people's feelings and emotions because you're going through that time of your life. You've got to be cold. You've got to be ruthless because if you're, you're not ruthless, you show weakness. I was I was very cold back then, you mm -hmm. know. I, I, don't know. I don't know what it was because, obviously, we've all done a lot of shit growing up. It was tit for tat back then. They come over here, we'll go over there. They've lost about 10 people to either a shooting or a knife crime, whereas mm -hmm. we've lost a few people as well. I'm at that point now where so much has happened from 2002 to like 2012. 
I'm willing to like as as much as it's sad, I'm sad about everything. I'm happy to just leave it there and be. If I see one of them, be like, we don't have to say hello or we don't have to do this. Let's just walk past each other. You know, nothing that I need to go on now. Do you think it'll still be on if anybody crossed paths <sighs> twenty years later? Maybe I I was in prison with a lot of these guys, and um, I was on you know like I was on a wing with them for about six months. When they first come on a wing, I was a massive. I was about sixteen stone at the time, bald head. I look like a bit of a thug. I've grown my hair now. Quite suits me, I thought as well. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like months have, m- months have gone by now, and I'm seeing these guys, and I'm doing the gym list, and they be like, I put me on the gym firm, wherever they talk and that. Uh, yeah, cool. But after a while, you're like, you want to go on the gym, mate? Before you know it, you're putting your thumb up. I ended up having conversations with some of these people and they didn't even understand why was we having these wars with you in the first place? I actually got on so well with some of them. I fell out with a couple of my close friends over this. Reason being, I'm six years into a prison sentence. I've not heard from you in six years. The first thing you phone me and say... Oh, Lou, you know, thingy's there. Have you moved to him yet? I'd be like, I've not heard from you in six years. And the first thing you come on my phone and say is, why haven't you, why haven't you got him yet? Why haven't you got him touched yet? And I said, and I kind of, we had, a, we had a fallout over it, but um, we sorted it out now. But there's loads of new little gangs up and coming now who was underneath us. And st- they still got their little dramas going on. I'm trying to get it in their heads, you lot. I've got friends doing 33 sentences and that now. I've been in Belmarsh myself for murder charges. Like I've not really spoken to anyone about my murder charge or what I went to prison for. My brother's been in prison for two murder charges. We got not guilties, but to be in amongst them sort of people who are doing 30 year sentences ain't nice. Mm-hmm. You know? Every single one of them who got a guilty all regret doing it. All, they all regret their actions. Yeah. Because like you say, what are you fighting over? Postcodes? Postcodes. Really? Who gives a fuck? Postcodes, you like I mean? when you think about the families that have been broken, t- put through hell, and like my mum's lost two brothers to murder. So, listen, my family's caused a lot of pain as well. But yeah. I understand that the the pain that she goes through every night is probably still not so much now that I'm doing good for myself. Like, it takes a lot of pressure off her, like, but it always repeats itself. Like a smell or a song. Or something like noise a motorbike just triggers something. Something triggers you're something. You've been fucking having the best day of your life, and then you're not having a good day. So you, there's a smell takes you back to something that yeah. triggers that negative thought, and that's mad because music's like, dangerous for that. Yeah. There's certain tunes that come on and be like, do you know what? I'm just gonna go. I'm, I'm just gonna go and fucking get him. Yeah. And then but, I just, because the the music, to the emotion that you'd felt that day is that's why you're connected to the song because if a, a trauma happens that day, if you remember that song was played that day. That's the connection to it. So you remember the trauma to the connection to the song. So if you some people go on holiday and they'll hear a holiday song. Every time yeah. they hear it five years, remember the time they went on that holiday? That was Yeah, yeah. You hear that song. So music's a powerful, powerful words, powerful everything. Like everything's powerful externally, but it's just trying to find the right mix where you're not going fucking crazy and doing bad stuff to cause that. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you're up for a murder charge were you in remand? Yeah, awesome. So um so t- let me take you back to 2005 when I first went to prison. Um, so I was doing cash and transit robberies. Mm-hmm. It's a really embarrassing story, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Let me in. So um, do you remember when the London tube bombings were going off? Yeah. So all the train stations were on high alert and stuff, wasn't it? 07, they? I think. Do you remember, was it? Yeah, I think it was 07. Anyway, this train station was on high alert for some reason. I didn't clock, but the cash was filling up the cash machines inside there. And um, I knew to get him on the last run because I know what the last run's like going to be a the decent one. Anyway, I've gone in the train station. There was about 30 old Bill armed police already in there. But by this time, I've already grabbed the cassette. I'm looking, I'm like, oh my God. I looked at my code, I said, we got to go. Started running. I frisbeed the, the cassette back at them because you know they're quite, they're quite heavy, some of them, you know. Frisbeed their legs. I've managed to get away. I've got back to the getaway vehicle. Anyway, I've got back there. My driver's not in the car. So I looked at my car and said, where the fuck is so-and-so? Looking around, this fucking cunt is over there having a piss. But I didn't have time to wait for him to get back over because the police are still running behind me. So I've had to run to the end of this road, 
come in the middle of the road and then I'm telling my friend, come, come and pick me up now. But the police can see me doing this, but they're not aware the driver's there. Anyway, another ball van's come behind me. They've nicked me. And um, as I'm in handcuffs, my driver's drove past in the ringer. And he just looked at us <laughs> like that. I was like, your mum. Like, that's what I said, your mum. He carried on driving. He got away anyway. And um, in court, where, where I was doing this to tell my friend, come, the police said that I was doing a money sign to them. There's like, oh, I've got money sort of thing. These times I'm telling my driver to come, to come. Because it was it looked so like, um, it didn't look very well planned. They only gave me three years, do 18 months. Um, so me and my other pal, we got three months, do 18 months. After eight months, I come out for like six weeks. I was on Obo straight away. And I got I got back grafting, selling uh, weed and that. And I didn't realise there's watching my house. So when I've put my hand through my gate, I had a gate, and then my door, then another gate. So they've watched me pass weed through the gate. It's only like two and a queue of weed. Anyway, they stopped my power around the corner, searched them, they found the weed. Then I've got a phone call, Lou. Uh, they just stopped so-and-so. So I put all my gear in my duffel bags, got out of the back door, went two minutes later, my house has gone through. Anyway, I've handed myself in for it. He's ended up getting a seventy pound fine for the turn of queue. Dave gave me ten months in prison, but because I was on the eighty month license. But as I was uh, about to be released from that, I was uh, charged for a murder. So um, I continued my remand time. Um, they moved me like from Wandsworth, Brixton. They accidentally sent me to High Point by accident for a week. And then I went to Belmarsh. Um, so I'd done the rest of the time in Belmarsh waiting for my trial. I think we had like about a 10 week trial or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to see where the jury was going with it. Um, so I was, I was, I was very confident anyway. Um, but to be accused of something like that, it just, it stays with you for a long time and that as well, you know? Yeah. Being accused and like I say, once you're accused, it's hard to get rid of that label. No matter if you're guilty or not guilty. Especially, the, yeah. Especially the life that you led. So nobody's yeah. going to ever believe a thing you say. And it was only a couple of years before that. My brother's been, <clears> went for a whole murder trial as well for a, for a shooting. Um, but lucky enough, like they see sense on that one. Cause like, I think my brother got stabbed in his neck or something like that. So he passed out. He was unaware of what happened after that. I think someone got shot straight after that. So I'm not, so um, my brother might even come and tell his story one day. So I'm going to leave that one for him. Yeah. How old is your brother? He's uh, two years older than me. Did he ever tell you, look, don't make the same mistakes? Because your dad wasn't there? Or was it just, you were just so alike we that it was normal? We were grafting. Yeah. Like, seriously, like, um, as a 15 and 16, 17 year old, I'll show you, I'll send you a picture later. Yeah. We was grafting. We was doing, we was going through like 20 boxes a week. Yeah. I think it's different because there's such so, so a short age gap. It's like you... Maybe having a wee brother at 10, 15 just now, you would tell him no. But if it was so close to your age, 34, yeah. 35, it would have just felt normal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So we, we was like, I don't know, everyone used to call us like the Bash Brothers. We was always like just, we was just on it. We was just on making money and at the same time putting things on the estate. Um, everyone loved us and that round there, yeah. you know. How was it being the only white kids in the estate as well? Did you have built um, that enough a reputation that nobody would fuck uh, with you? Hundred percent. Like I'm not saying we was like Charlie Big Bollocks and that, but um, the res the respect we was getting was because we was genuine people. It's not like I used to try and bring so much people in, but that was my downfall. Where I'd be trying to help him or him, he run off with like a fucking kilo of weed or something like that. I won't hear from him for six months. He run off with an ounce. I used to try and help everyone out on the estate. No one can't say a bad word about me, you know. Mm -hmm. What was it like doing your first bank job? What, the one I got the three years for? Yeah. Uh, I was, I, to, to be honest, I was more embarrassed because my dad was in prison at the time. He just finished, he was doing a mm -hmm. ten and a half for the same things. Kamikaze number? With all kamikazes that just N not nah, planned? No, nah, so the one I just come out for was... Planned? That, that, was, that, was, a, that was a planned one, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that adrenaline like for you? Do you know what? Sometimes it wasn't even about the money. I used to like... I used to enjoy getting the cars and bikes and parking them up places, knowing if I drive the car to this bit, I can actually walk through the alleyway. They can't follow me. I can get into another motor and fuck off. So I liked all the planning parts of things and that, and obviously it helped having mm -hmm. money in that as well. So seeing you're doing the boxes, like it's, when you're taking them, obviously sometimes you can get just change. Sometimes you can get maybe 20 bags, 50 bags. Like yeah, you've got to... 
you got to kind of be on it. Like, you know, um, it's, I'm not giving advice to people, but yeah. I'd do a cash machine because, you know, one of them's going to have a 20 grand in, one's going to have a 15, one's going to have a 40. Mm -hmm. The one I went to prison for had the 45,000 in. Do you know what? The geezer gave me a proper fight as well. Like the geezer pro proper out and straight on it with me. I've, like two weeks before that robbery took place, the geezer doing the delivery was about this this high. I thought, oh, this is going to be a touch. I'm just going to walk straight in there and take all the trays back out the machine. By the day of the robbery, this big bloke's got out of the van and what I found out in court, he was a British ex-powerlifting champion. If he got hold of me, I'd have been in trouble. So as I got out of the car, I thought, you know, I'm just going to take it. I've got a dog in my hand now anyway. But as I stuck it on him, um, he's, he wasn't scared one bit. He swung for me first. And I was doing a bit of white colour boxing at the time. And I've kind of rolled it. And it's not until I got to court, I realised how many times I actually hit him because I knocked all his teeth out, which I'm gutted for. I wish I don't plan on anyone getting hurt if I do these things and that, you know. So for that, I would apologise, you know. And the things I've knocked him out, spark out on top of the on top of the cassette. So he's laying on top of this money, this 20 stone bloke. I've had to do a deadlift to get him off the money and then get back in the motor. And my Cody was like, fucking hell, he's almost had you on that one. He thought it was funny. I was like, fucking drive the car, you bastard. It's fucked up, but I know the like, madness that you go through in life. Like, so see when you're doing that, was it just a case of if you're doing 20 boxes a week as well, you must have been fucking earning. So yeah, no, why did you need to jump on that no, side there of things? Certain, there were certain times, I'm not sure if like um, you're aware, like in London, I think it happens everywhere. Sometimes there's, there's a massive drought and people only really have like shit weed knocking about like Dutch or something like that. So just to keep me ticking over sometimes, I'd quickly go and get a tw 20 quid from somewhere, you know? But did your dad know what you were doing at this point? Like, my dad knew what I was doing and he was a bit worried about the people who I was around doing it, you know, like for grassing and talking if it ever does come on top, you know? My dad's always tried to push me away and prevent me from doing these things. Mm -hmm. Like, he used to tell me how much he's missed us and missed mum and stuff like that. Um, he knew that that went out the other ear. So he probably thought the next best thing is you do it with me. There's no, there's no grassing going on. Yeah, I've got your back. You've got my back. And you done jobs with your dad? Just the one we got caught for. How was that doing a job with your dad? Um, part of me, I think my dad was going through a bit of a hard time. Then you know he lost a lot of stuff, like money wise and assets and stuff. And part of me made, felt like he wanted to go back to prison, like because he was he was out every day out every day Lou I've just seen this one I'm like cool dad uh, sweet I don't really care mm -hmm. he used to get really excited about him and then I started getting a bit excited about him it started getting that bad I was, I, I was having sleepless nights thinking that that van's going to be doing that petrol station at 2 o'clock tomorrow I could, I've got a motor already up that way I can go and get that one out of the way that's a quick 20 quid yeah you know it's mad though isn't it to like, think like you've got your how old's your daughter oh my daughter's, she's 11 next month. Can you imagine taking your daughter out on a job? It's heartbreaking. Do you know what? Every every day I, I almost tear up thinking about my daughter, you know? Like, I try, I'm trying to be around her as much as I can. And it's so sad because I'm so happy to see her. But sometimes we're together and I don't know what to say to her sometimes. Why do you think that is? I just feel like I've just done way too much. I know there's still time for me to rebuild. Like, we still have great times, so don't get me wrong, I'll take her out over the park or we do, like, activities together. But was just, there was an occasion where I took her to the aquarium not so long ago. We was on the bus and I was just looking at her and I was actually thinking of, wow, what can I say next? But it's mm -hmm. just something I'm still working on. I'm still trying to build that bond and that with her, you know? Yeah, that's all you can do. As long as you're still there, as long as you're staying out of prison, then you're winning already. Yeah. But as long as the temptation doesn't come back, you're feeling skint, you need to get Christmas presents. Oh, I, this is what I'm saying. I've, mm. I've been skint since I come out. A few of the boys looked after me, like clove wise and stuff. But I'm I'm used to having a, a few quid in my pocket. So for me, this is this has been a struggle. It's been a massive test. Like I'm living off £320 a week, what the job centre give me now. I never used to go to the job centre. But now I'm trying to do things right, you know. Yeah, you're starting at the, the bottom, but it's better off starting off there than, than trying to come out of prison or being in prison and you've not got nothing to work with. You're out, man. Like, how many... Uh, there's people in the jail watch this stuff all the time and they'll relate to you so much. Like, it's not that they're bad people. They've just fucking done bad shit. Yeah. Like, and it's sad because 
I've got so many friends who are dead or are doing lifers that yeah. are good fucking people who could, if they put their head to something else would have been successful at it. And that's the frustrating thing. I've only just seen the other end. Like, I was never violent, but I was always in the mix. I always fucking knew what was going on and I was always capable if need be, but I used to think there's more to life and I'm just blessed that I've found something that I'm good at and something I can make a living from and something I can be successful at. But it takes time. It took me 33 years, 34 years yeah. to... I never thought I'd be fucking sitting interviewing people. Do you know what I mean? No. I'm just a kid from Glasgow. I, I wouldn't have ever thought I'd even be sitting in front of cameras, but it's people like yourself and even, even Bounce, like we've come from similar backgrounds. I see what he's doing right now. It's, it's motivating me right yeah. now. It's he's proper, hustling, man. He's hustling. He's hustling. Like, mm -hmm. we need to have words soon, Bounce. Like, yeah. um, <laughs> like seriously, man. How he's, did your relationship with Bounce start? Uh, do you know what, Bounce? We still need to, need to have words about this. So, mm -hmm. um, Obviously, I used to sell drugs growing up. I was always selling weed. And I remember this, there was a drought at one point and someone wanted, um, they wanted five um, boxes of weed and that, they was going for 34s at the time. There's only boxes of Dutch. This was all my brother's idea, man. So anyway, we was putting boxes of sawdust together, wrapping them back up and we had leave like an ounce in the corner. So if anyone wants to cut the side or the corner open, they can smell it or take a bud. So um, anyway, words got back to Bouncer that there's like 10 boxes in this house. But me and Bouncer ain't friends at this point, um, point in it. So he's got his little team together. And the girl whose house it was, Bouncer's got another female to knock the door so they can make entry. Anyway, they run off with boxes of sawdust, which I'm in bits about. Me and we have little um, laughs about it to this day. Um, we, we, almost, we almost had beef over it, but um, he was from like Croydon Ways where I'm from Battersea. And we never actually got bumped into each other, but we had a lot of mutual friends, which kind of um, watered everything down and that, you know. They were like, Lou, if, the, um, if, if, if it was on your side, you would have definitely robbed him for them two boxes as well, which uh, I would have. Mm -hmm. If I knew Bounce had 10 in his house at the time, I'm coming to his <laughs> house instead. So now I, I think, do you know what? It's a funny story. Mm -hmm. And from that, our mutual friend kind of brought us together. Then we met up again in prison. And do you know what? He used to just give me a lot of information and just told me to make sure you got a plan when you come out of prison that, you know, yeah. him and my dad really got on as yeah. well. Cause his knowledge of life is spot on. Like he's lived a life. Like a lot of people don't really know his backstory from the robberies, from all yeah. the shit that he done. Yeah. And he's just straight hustling and puts everything into the wicked and bad. And yeah. he's got his drink, he's got his face, he's got Sunday smoke, like, and big Tyrone, who I'm good friends with, man. Like the two of them got on well and the social media is popping. You, people are going to get hate when you become successful, especially yeah. coming from the streets because nobody's really doing that well with their life. They're going to hate on you. But nothing but love and respect for Bouncer for what he's doing, what he's achieving and what he's trying it's to do. It's motivational, man. Yeah. man. Motivational. Like it's, it's now um, people like Bouncing yourself, you're opening doors for other people. Mm. Every time I go on social media now, I'm thinking, do you know what? I could just go through this door. I can kind of make something happen here and that, you know? But for me, um, a lot of it's confidence bu uh, building. I'm still, I'm still learning a lot of things. Um, I still struggle with anxiety day to day, but I'm starting to get on top of things, you know? Yeah. Is that the PTSD because of the shit that you have caused in the past? Yeah, it, it probably is. And it, it doesn't help. Like my mum's like, she's got mental health uh, mm -hmm. problems herself. So part of me used to question things. Am I, am I like my mum? And it's quite scary. She's done like mental hospitals and stuff. And I've had visits there and, I've had little mini breakdowns over them sort of situations and that as well. It's only like a month ago. Like, I wish I wasn't even here. Like, I was thinking, I don't even want to wake up in the morning. Why am I here? You know? So, so you do? Yeah, I was having them thoughts. I was having them thoughts, man. But then you've got a daughter, man. That, that's the only thing that must keep you going and keep you sane. Because it is hard. I had those thoughts when I had two kids back in the day. Like, first five, six years, I was non-existent. I was there. I would show up, get a photo think I've done daddy duties. Now I'm a dad. Now I do care. Now I, everything yeah. I do, I, I do for me, but then it, it helps the people around me to, everything's connection, everything's love. Like I still have my doubts. I still have my flaws. I still think yeah. fucking crazy shit, but I just know that's why I don't drink or take drugs anymore because I know I can rip the whole ceiling down. I actually yeah. had a, a dream, mate, two days ago that I was bang on it. Yeah. Bang on the sniff, mate, and I woke up and I thought I was on it and I come down, I genuinely thought I was on it and I thought I fucked everything. I took my couple of minutes to get round and I realised it fucking scared the shit out of me. I can't drink. I can't drink. If I have one drink, I'm bang on the sniff and I'm just the man who just could have been something. 
Yeah. Because I'll rip the whole fucking ceiling down and I, and I, I ain't got another recovery in me, bro, to change nearly 40. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've fucking worked relentless to keep on the path. I've created the path. But the self-sabotage can kick in. Because if you start building a bond with your daughter and getting closer and closer, yeah. your dad gets out, you're closer and closer, you've got a job. Yeah. Sometimes that's not enough, even though it's everything you've ever wanted. And sometimes they self-sabotage for you. you know, you've got a shooter, man, you're away doing a van for fucking 20 bags yeah, and you're quick. back in doing a 15. But it's crazy how many men I've actually spoke to who have changed their life. It wasn't good enough. <laughs> Sam Miller, who I had on, he was in the IRA. Get beaten, battered in prison. He got, fuck, he got out, went to America, met his love of his life working in a casino, making thousands, changed his life, got out smashed of the IRA, it. smashed it. But a job opportunity came it was, it, was a, it was a bank job, millions, New York, couldn't resist. Done it, jailed, life. Look at that, man. Yeah, uh, his wife, everything. And with the Good Friday Agreement, he did get out after a few years, but th he didn't need to do it. He had everything he ever wanted, but the temptation of, I says, why the fuck did you do it? And he just says, I thought something was missing. I wanted to test myself to see if he could do it. I've I've had I've had people approach me since I've been mm -hmm. home, like to go and take things off people. But you know, it's it's not me now. You know, as much as I could do with the readies and that, it's it's not me. How hard is it to knock back? It's do you know for me, it's got a lot easier. I'm happy just to plod along now. You know, how many jails you been in? Um, well over ten. Uh, obviously started off in Feltham, Young Offenders, 2005. From there, went to Portland, Rochester. Then I come out, went to Wandsworth, High Point, Brixton, Belmarsh. And then on the third one, I done High Down for a few years, Cold and Lee for a year or so, on Lee for a few years. And then I eventually got decap for my last 18 months. What was Brixton like? Because the Battersea and Brixton don't go under there. Uh, do you know, um, that was a bloody shithole. Lucky enough, I was on a wing where it was, it was fairly quiet. Um, I was only there for a few weeks because my trial was in Bel um, Old Bailey for the, um, the murder case. So um, I went straight to uh, Belmarsh. I actually enjoyed Belmarsh. I had a lot of friends. We was all on the same wing and we was all up for murder charges. Some of us went home. Some of us got 30s. It's it's sad, man. Yeah. How is that scene? Like somebody both going for trials, separate trials. One gets a fairy, one gets off. That like. it, it happened at my trial. There was um, some fellas from North London. They was actually linked up with the Brixton ones for um, a shooting in Streatham. And some of them went home, and like the main guy, he ended up getting a twenty-five. But on the day I got a not guilty, I was in two minds because we were on trial at the same time. I was, I was in two minds to go to his flat and say, oh, I've got a not guilty, you know. Cause I had a feeling he was gonna get a guilty. Um, he's in Grendon now as well, actually doing pretty well. So all the best for him if he does yeah. if, when he's up for parole and that. How was Bill Marsh? Bill Marsh was right. Uh, a couple of my pals were the Jim Audleys there, so I, I had it good. I had at least like ten of my pals were all on the same wing, and we was all up for murder charges. So we all used to talk to each other in the yard and go through each other's paperwork. And this is one of the reasons why I actually got into boxing, you know. I had some, um, I don't really want to say his name, but I had some Irish fella in the cell with me. He's quite well known around the prison system and he was just fighting with everyone, having absolute wars with all like, the Muslims and stuff. They wasn't getting on. But he used to teach them how to um, do pads, you know, using the shower slippers mm -hmm. and that. And he used to just fucking rib shot me and I said, you know what, when I get out, I'm going to have a white collar fight, which I did. I only had two. Um, but it's all because of him. He's actually out now. He's finished his IPP, so he's doing really well as well at the moment. How did you get through your sentences? Training was a massive thing. I've lost a few stone now due to um, a couple operations I've had now on my shoulder. But the exercise just does something for you, you know. It just releases so much and it just wears you out when the evening comes you know i'm an overthinker so you mm -hmm. know when the night time comes i would just be laying there for hours just overthinking things like what's the, what's the missus doing and things like that whereas my training would kind of tire me out so much i wouldn't think about it as much yeah if you never exercised you think you would still be here oh mate if i didn't oof. i don't know do you know what, to be honest i don't have no no 
suicidal thoughts in prison. It's not until I got released. Do you think that's because you've, you're coming to ref- face the facts that the, the misery you have caused on a lot of people, especially the robberies, because there's always victims. There's, Even the men who are, are standing there, security guards, like, yeah, yeah. their heads will be fried. Because you know what? My, my, the crime I went to prison for, what I got the, the 17 years for, it was on uh, Judge Rinder. On, um, he'd done Judge Rinder's Crime Stories Week. And it's not until I see um, the security guard's wife talking and in tears, you, you realise it affects a lot of people. But at the time, you don't. You're just thinking, quick 40 grand. Mm-hmm. And I see, I was like, oh, man, I feel, like, I feel a bit shit. Um, but Judge Rinder proper mugged me off, though. You know they've done the reconstruction, yeah? Yeah, what happened? So they made a reconstruction of the whole robbery. Mate, I was in good nick. I was in proper good shape. They made some skinny crackhead man play me in the reconstruction. I was looking, it's like, mate, they could have got someone like Tom Hardy or someone <laughs> to play me. Like, I was being laid to at liberties. <laughs> then they got some big fat bloke to play my dad. So all the boys were absolutely ripping, <laughs> ripping us on the wing, kicking mm. their doors. Look at Lou, look at his dad. Absolutely ripping us. Uh, we come out to loads of, loads of abuse in the morning, laughing their heads off. Because the governor had to come and give us a heads heads up first that you're going to be aired on ITV. It's going to be aired on this time. And yeah, no, you done me dirty, that one. You done me dirty. Mm-hmm. How was that getting a 17? What are you thinking then, standing in the dock? Oh my God. So I was expecting to like get a 12-year sentence at the worst. So when they stood up, it started off with a 16-year sentence. I got an extra year for the um, the money what I took. So I got an extra year for twenty two and a half thousand. So I ended up being seventeen. But when he's when they stood up and sentenced me, and he said, uh, "Lewis Clark, I sentenced you to seventeen years." I said, "Who me?" I looked behind me like they made a mistake. My my dad's found it funny. He's like, "Oh, they fucking stitched you right up, mate." Like because he's already been sentenced. He's got his uh, eight and a half years life sentence. So um, he's like, "I just want to get back to the fucking prison. Nice chip day, you know. On a Friday, you get your chips every Friday in prison." And um, I was thinking, no, this can't be right. I tried to appeal it and stuff, and um, they just wasn't having it. What messed me up with that trial, I took it to trial because the evidence was really weak. So there was a chance of me going home. There was, um, they didn't find the gun that was used. They found no money that was taken. No DNA was found in the car that was used. They had a cell site what put me in a five-mile radius of that area of that morning, but couldn't pinpoint me to that bit. So I was on bail for nearly a year over this case. And they started following me. They signed up to my gym. They started going on all the lockers. There's are looking in all the roof panels for the, like, the, the gun or the money. And then they followed me to Bista Village one time. And I'm not really into fashion. I'm not really into clothes. And I was buying the kids some, like, um, I had a 50% off Ralph Lauren and uh, Gucci. So I just bought the kids some little bits and pieces to treat them. But they actually followed me there, taking pictures of me spending money. But the money what I had on me, my boxing promoter paid me £10,000 for my last three fights. Because I was quite a big ticket seller. Um, but yeah, the judge wasn't hearing it. They took all my clothes off me, took my daughter's clothes. So, yeah. And that was enough to convict you? Yeah, and obviously I've got previous for cash and transits and my dad's literally just finished a ten and a half for one as well. Do you think because because of the stuff you did, that's the thing, man, like I've spoke to a lot of people as well who've got a lot of, away with so much and they get the bigger sentence for the things that they've never done because they want to get, you know, more of what because I, can you understand I, that as well? I can't, I count my blessings because they could have easily got a, um, gave me a wrongly conviction for my, the, the murder. murder case as mm-hmm. involved. I could have got a 25 or a 30 rec for that, you know. <clears> so when I've got that, um, even though they got the, they got it right with the not guilty. Sometimes you do hear about cases when they do get it wrong occasionally, you know. Yeah, it's not that they get it wrong, man. There's a lot of shit there that puts the paperwork in front of them. There's a lot of corruption there as well. They that's... can make you look so guilty. Yeah. Like they was putting things in in our case, like because the evidence was so weak. There's like, look, they went to B and Q and they looked to see how much this kitchen cost. Here's a three and a half grand kitchen. Mm-hmm. So what was the charges for the seventeen? So I've got um, nine years for the gun, 16 years for the robbery, and 12 months for the um, confiscation order. Um, is um, what's it called? Conspiracy to commit armed robbery. And your dad got an eight. And he got eight and a half. But what killed me off is the geezer said, when I stuck the gun to him, he said that I pulled the trigger. And then he said, I looked at the gun to say, why didn't you go off sort of thing? 
But I've watched a little bit of the video. You can clearly see me put the gun to him. He swings for me. I kind of grab him one arm, gun back to him with the other. I don't, I don't pull the trigger. I wouldn't shoot someone for 40 grand. Why did they, why did they try and, listen, it's their job, but why do you think some people try and become heroes when they ain't getting paid enough? I don't get it. Like, you're insured for that money. It's you're not in, their money either. It's not even their money. Just, just put it down and go home. You get to go back home to your to your family that night, you know? Mm. It's easier for us to sit here and say that, but I probably just try to do the good deed. They probably just hard workers try to save some money and, but again, it's your life. Somebody puts a banger to your head, man. Fucking give it up, man. Like, it's give it up. Yeah. Like, like, I think he knew his stuff, though. Like, he's, like I said, he was a British powerlifting champion and he served like 10 years in Afghanistan or something. So he knew about his guns and machines and yeah. stuff, you know? His pride would have been on the line probably pr- as well. Def- definitely. Do you know what I mean? Like, I remember when he walked through the court doors, like, he was that big. He had to walk through sideways, like how a crab walks to get through the doors. Like, fucking hell, if this geezer gave me a clump, I would have been in trouble. Mm-hmm. You know? What would you do if you seen this guy? I'd, I'd hope I'd hope he did a shake to handshake, you know. If mm-hmm. I could give him a handshake and say, do you know what? I was going through some shit. And, um, do you know, I was very down in them days as well. I had money in my pocket, but I was I was really stressed in that, you know. I was going through some difficulties with my daughter's mum and that. And... I just wanted to get out of the house most days, you know. Yeah. How is it with Batsy and Brixton now? Because I know people from both ends. I've been in both ends and I'm treated fucking... The food is amazing. The people are amazing. I've been in with some fucking proper people and both treat me with a lot of respect. It's getting a whole lot better with the yeah. older generation. Like, I'm 36 in, in a few weeks. So, like, my sort of age group now, I can actually see them and be like, hey, what's happening? Like, Aaron, every, everything's sweet. It's like I was looking back on some old music videos I was in the other day. I was absolutely cringing to hell. <laughs> I'm the skinniest white kid in these videos. I'm like doing little gang signs and I'm like, oh, I want to die right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, you grow up, you know. Yeah, we're you grow all young up. Ones and I see a lot of like the ones that don't get on with from over them sort of sides. They're doing really well with their music or they're doing like podcasts and they're making some positive yeah, changes that's themselves. the thing mate like, if you actually sat in a room with someone that you didn't like for no reason you'd probably fucking get on there's a good chance you got on because there's both similarities there by both yeah. groups like you say I've, I've been in both mate and nothing but respect because I used to always be wary of London I used to think man it's fucking unhappy place here see once you actually get into the fucking heart of it and actually meet people you realise man there's so much culture the food the vibe like, there's so much goodness down here Yeah. even in the gangs that like, I've met them and I couldn't be more. Um, I don't know. They're just they're just loyal, man, and they're, but they're fucking wired up wrong, bro. They're tapped up wrong, yeah, but they are crazy, man, man, man. But I love London as a place now, and it's grabbed a big piece of my heart since I've been down here in the last three years. And because I've met so many individuals and they've been showing me around, but I've nothing but love and respect for it because I know how crazy it is, but I also know how loyal some people are down here. But I know how fucking ruthless it can be as well. I I all made a phone call to one of them the other day, like not here to say names and that, but I all made a phone call. So he like, I know this has happened. Can we let this one go now? Do you know what I mean? Because certain of my friends have been released from prison now. I mean, like, listen, he's grown up. I've got a couple of their numbers in my phone. I'd phone them, FaceTime, and what are you up to, mate? How's your, how's your day been? And I've, I would love to be able to put a stop to certain situations, but there's going to be some that I just can't prevent, and I, and I just hope I'm never there. Yeah. How do you feel if somebody did put it on you, and you're trying to find peace in your life now, you're trying to find the light, you're trying to do the best thing, because the temptation's always there, that like you've still got to fight for your honour, but how would you feel? Mate, do you know what? If, if I could walk away from a situation which I've not been tested yet, to be honest... Well, if someone pulls a knife out on me or a gun, it's obviously I'm not going to try and fight. I'm just going to try and get away or whatever. But if someone comes and they stick it all over me, I'll be like, listen, just, let's just leave it here. But if they start sticking it on me, I don't mind if we do have a fight and it's left at that sort of thing. But mm-hmm. down here, it's not left at that. Why do you think you're trying to find peace now? I just want something better for themselves and their family and their kids. And I want something for better for my family and my kids. I put my mum through hell. Getting the doors kicked in every other week, selling drugs or for armed robbery with arm, arm please put my mum on the floor or put my little brother on the floor. My little brother's nothing like me. He's autistic. So 
to keep putting him through things like that. And I, I feel like I'm part of the reason why he is the way he is. My little brother don't, don't even come out of his room. He's this housebound. He's 20, it's his birthday yesterday. So happy birthday, Alf. Happy birthday, Alfie. Um, Yeah, I just wish I could get him out of the house and that more, man. Like he's just so shy. He's a little gamer. I'm glad he's a little gamer and nothing like me and my older brother. But I just wish I could do a little bit more and get him out of the house. I blame myself for my mum having mental breakdowns. What was her mental health like before? Like, she's been going, even over the last few weeks, she's just been going through some shit, man. Like, and at the moment, um, I only come down to Batsy twice a week to pick my door up. So I will pop in to my mum's to see her as well, have a coffee. But she's she's been struggling with, with her mental health. Like, she's schizophrenic. Like, she's probably tried to commit suicide a few times. Do you see a lot of yourself in your mum as well? I do. Like I see more of myself in my mum than my dad. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, I feel like I, c I could easily, well, not now because I feel strong today, but it's a few weeks ago I felt I felt pretty weak, like I could do something mad. Why do you think that ar arose? Because I'm so stubborn, yeah? If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to have to do it. Even if it was 10 years ago? 20 years ago? because you're talking about you want to forget and yeah move on but are you still finding it hard to let go of things in the past yourself no i've let go of so much like i said my brother's been shot i don't even want them people in prison like i don't even want nothing to happen to them i what i want them to do is never do that again mm -hmm. yeah i don't know who did it where they live now nothing just don't ever do that again how many friends do you think you've lost I've lost at least, at least six friends to like either gunshots or knife crime. Um, even like the people we used to have trouble with, they've probably lost about 10 to 12 people themselves. Like we're taking people away from their families on either side. Like if I got 30, my mum's losing out on me now for 30 years. Yeah. I've got a friend doing 33 years in prison now and he's only like 13 years in and I'm just thinking you still got another 20 to go. Is that a 33 deck? Yeah, 33 deck. <laughs> I think someone got shot shot like 10 times. And he, he's just, I went to visit him just before I went away and I see like pictures of him recently and he doesn't look like he's doing too well. The person I left was all active and confident now, withdrawn, probably smoking that spice or something. It's just sad to see, you know. You still have license? I've got eight years. I've done. I've got eight years and a month left on license. I've been out for like four months now, five months. Foxy. So they got me on like a crime prevention order. So it's a bit sticky at the moment. So like, if I want to get into your motor, I've got to phone the old bill and say I'm getting to so and so's motor. This is his registration plate. And if I'm leaving London, I've got to give them a 24 hour notice. I'm leaving London, and this is where we're going. Can you understand why you've got that though? Yeah, I can understand why I've got that. I'm only allowed the one phone. Um, obviously, still reporting to probation once a week. Got probation on in a couple of days. But he's actually being helpful on that, you know? Mm -hmm. Is so, it because some POs are fucking... Uh, some of them are terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I've had some shit ones along the way, but this one's actually been resourceful. He's actually going out of his way and offering advice and courses. Mm -hmm. So I'll give it to that one. Do you think you'll stay out? I'm out. I'm out. I could feel something big's going to happen for me, like maybe early next year. I'm just going to continue. I've literally got two more weeks left on my personal training course for my level three. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to crack on with that and hopefully get some YouTube st uh, video content out there soon. Yeah, with your training. These with podcasts, have you got any YouTube set up yet? Yeah, yeah, I've got my What's, YouTube set up. Plug it all in now, bro. What so, yeah, um, just type it in Big Lou Gym Bars. It's basically short little interviews and workouts with like your favorite UK rappers, social mm. influencers. Um, I've done one already with a professional boxer called Denzel Bentley. He's fighting for the British middleweight title on Friday at the O2 Arena, Channel 5. So mm. yeah, watch that one, it'd be a good watch. Yeah, so you've got a lot of things happening now. It's just try to unravel all that pain. It's not just going to happen overnight. It's a long, steady journey, years and years. Do you know what I mean? You're only recently out, like, it's just try to adapt to fucking society again and try to stay clean, try to stay away from the bad things. Plus, when you try to start making changes and build a bond with your daughter, it's the more time you spend with your kids to realise, wait a minute, like, what if I hurt someone's dad or 
who's got kids and exactly it, it, it's the horrible shit and then seeing your mum like because it's all human beings all we're all sensitive beings no matter how tough you think you are no matter if you're doing a life or no matter if you've robbed 40 50 banks no matter if you're a bare knuckle fighter like you actually speak to everybody a one-on-one -on -one, you realize how sensitive and soft you they do. are as well that's what yeah. that's what people need to be doing you need to be like open up a little bit more see the one-on-one -on -one sessions they work so much better yeah i've always got so i like I used to do like a resolve course in prison like you do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions and i found they helped more than the group sessions you know you get a lot more yeah. out of them have you done therapy i've done um a just be, um offending behavior programs done resolve tsp is like a thinking skills program mm. i've just done little things like that and that you know like you don't take a lot from them you take bits and pieces you know like what's your red flags and stuff and what sort of situations would you avoid next time so you, i've learned a few things from them yeah, but they can be a positive or negative because the red things you learn, you can fucking end this, up learning more and going to do jobs. Do absolutely mad? I remember 2005, um, it was called ETS back then, Enhanced Thinking Skills. I remember taking part in this course and I'm thinking, this is making me more clued up to do another robbery. Yeah. <laughs> I looked at my code because we're on the same course. It's like, I was like, hey, why don't we do that? Like, so next time you're going to be more assertive. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's mad doing that. It's like, is there anybody you can speak to now? Like when you're struggling a couple of weeks ago, is there anybody you can reach out to? Or have you got too much pride to try Didn't, and do it yourself? I've still got a little bit of pride. Like I, I sort of speak, speak to my missus every night, FaceTime for an hour or so when I, when I can't see her. But I've got a good friend, George. I'd reach out to him. How like, do you deal with that now, the relationship side of stuff? It's, it's it's nice. I can't have a full on relationship at the minute. Like I see my missus like twice a week. Why are you just so that one? I love being by myself. Is that the condition she, in a prison? She, she understands that sometimes I love waking up in my bed and no one else is there. Because you know when you're in a routine, I wake up, I chill for like ten seconds. Curtains come up, kettle goes on, and if she stays over, um, she wants to try and lay in. I'm just trying to push her out of bed. Come <laughs> up. Once we're up, we're up, and she goes mental sometimes, and that you know. But she's so she's fully understanding. Has that been institutionalized, or you're just so? Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's what my dad got me into. He got me into a mm. routine. Get the curtains open, get a kettle on. I bet you're banging your fucking spin now. I bet you smash my. I, I was. <laughs> hey, she told me off for it. I put the kettle on. She went absolutely mad. Uh -huh. She just gave me the side eye, and she was going mental. Like yeah. that, she was just, uh, uh, fuck's sake, man. How's your dad now? Dad is, he gets uh, home leaves, town visits. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had a race. I let him have a race with my daughter the other day. And a couple of his old school pals come down. They had, a, they had an over 50s foot race. So I filmed it. I was absolutely pissing myself. Mm. But he, he looks like a changed man. Do you think both of you can come out and change your life? Yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd love him to come out because my dad's fucking so handy with his hands, like grafting wise. He knows everything, like putting kitchens together, flooring, paint, and decorating. He's so handy. Whereas yeah. I've never really been into all of that. Because if you come out, if your dad comes out, you both change your life. Because if even listen, you're not making money from crime, but there's there's opportunities there for books and documentaries, possibly films that like father and son robbing banks together. That is fucked up. But again, people mate, would like to watch that shit. Hey, Guy Ritchie needs to get at me for yeah, that one. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, because a shout, mate. Tom Hardy's Fuck. waiting to play your part. That's though. what I'm saying, man. You don't listen. You don't know who watches these. You don't know what's round the corner. But as long as you can stay true to you and try and clean your soul as much as you can, and never think that it's over because you have a couple of bad days. Just remember that you're free. Just remember that you're out and you're trying and you're trying. It's not just, your 36 years life has been in fucking misery, bro. There's no point in denying it. You've seen dead bodies, guys shot in the fucking nut. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's fucked up shit. This, but if you can come through that and do it in a positive light and write about your pain of the past, even coming, getting the young team from Battersea and Brixton and bring them together and trying having conversations and shaking hands, like, that's what it's all about. Try and, to teach people not to make the same mistakes you've done but when your yeah. dad comes out then both of you can do positive things for the community for better people not to make go and speak at schools go and speak at prisons these are opportunities that arise and it's good for the fucking yeah. soul it definitely you feel like you're giving you're giving something back in it you know yeah. I do actually go there's a little um, cherry run gym called uh, Carney's Community in Battersea they actually help like younger versions of myself and that you know and that's where I go to do my um my personal training course and that as well so if i can offer advice to them i always have a little sit down yeah. and how are you around people i'm 
getting better. I'm no, getting like better. normal people that not criminals that. I'm getting better because do you know what I used to struggle with, James? I used to feel like I don't fit in. Even though I've got so much love and support by like friends and family and even social media who I, some people I don't even know always reach out and that. But I just, I don't feel like I fit in at anyone's table. Like even though I know he loves me and he supports me, I feel like I can't be here for too long. I'm going to have to shoot off in a minute. Is that just your insecurities? Maybe. Like I feel like I'm, I'm begging it sort of thing or I'm just forcing conversations. I actually pulled my friends aside and said, you know, I'm going to go for a little 10 minute break and come back. But they're, they're, so, they're understanding with these sort of things and that, you know. What about how much money do you think you've spent over the last 20 years? I was doing dumb things. I was living in like um, ranges and next sixes, like rentals and stuff, spending stupid money weekly when I've got nothing to show for nothing now. Mm -hmm. That could have been like a down payment, little mortgage. I was interested in jewellery, going out every weekend, treating the lads. I just wish I put all my money <laughs> to the side. Yeah, but hindsight's a wonderful thing, bro. And you've obviously been dealt these cards. It's just down to you how you play them. Like, you're out now, you're free. Everything that you've ever wanted, been lying caged up, now you're, you're out. So yeah, no. it's just down to you. Anything's possible. Do your fitness video. Try and get your YouTube popping. Start a podcast or get guests on and talking about life. Like, I'm more than happy to have your dad on when he's out, you and your dad, and having a discussion. I thought that because it's that one will be massive. Yeah, because this is therapy sessions, bro. Like people always say, oh, you're promoting criminals. I ain't fucking promoting criminals. I know the pain it causes. I've been one for years. Like I've, I've, I've done good. I've done bad. That's just life. But my job is to give people an understanding of why people are the who they are, and people battle and struggle. I've had entrepreneurs on who've been suicidal. I've had millionaires on billionaires. I've had homeless men on. It's changed their life and become millionaires. That like, people's got a story. No, and people's always got something to give, no matter how dark or deep their problems go. And that's the beautiful thing about life. That like, we just don't know what the next day is going to deal us. Yeah. It's a fucking it's a it's a weird this experience is weird. Life is fucking weird. I've never I've never quite mastered what no. it's about, bro. And I don't ever think I will. I think sometimes I've got it figured, but then sometimes I chase money still, and sometimes I like I, I love good things, but then I question it because I think, well, it's it is irrelevant. But then I crave it sometimes. I crave attention on social media. It's, I can never find the right balance. This is what I was doing in prison. Obviously, you know, you're, you're not meant to have phones in, in prison. Yeah. But I've done my whole sentence with a smartphone. And I found myself living on social media, putting up pictures. You know, like even like taking my top off, thinking mm -hmm. I'm looking hench and stuff. That was kind of me asking for a bit of help, you know. That was kind of me thinking, oh, I like my picture or comment or check in on me, you know. Um, I used to do that nearly every day, but I just wanted someone to reach out. Lou, you're right. But it's only an odd one or two people who had meant, like, see me doing mad things. Yeah. Like, every day I put a new picture up. Why are you doing that? You're in prison, Lou. Just enjoy having a phone. Enjoy a FaceTime in the kids whenever you can. Yeah, yeah. It's like sticking yourself in. And that, have you ever came across any snitches? Has anybody ever stuck yeah. you and threw you under the bus? Um, has everybody been 100 what in prison yeah or, just in jobs well, that you've done or been at court even if boy um, on that murder case someone really did try to throw me under the bus like no names and that he didn't say that it was like me who done anything but for the person who that was I didn't know you was about that sort of life saying oh I heard they didn't get on why did you even have to mention anything like, you know, like the way I used to settle things growing up was we used to have a lot of fist fights, like to settle things and that, you know. So, yeah, I did come across one and a few in prison and stuff who would say, oh, I'll lose selling tobacco on the wing or whatever. Because, you know, when the smoking ban come in, yeah, uh, you know, for like an ounce of tobacco, it's like 11 pounds in prison. As soon as that ban come in, an ounce of tobacco in prison is 250 pounds. What? It's like a gold it's mine. A fucking barahash. Mate, you're living. If you can get knock yeah. out four of them like a week, that's that's a that's a bag a week quickly. And somebody know? stopped you in? Yeah, someone started probably because I wasn't giving them little bits and pieces and that. But the thing is, they can actually break an ounce of tobacco down into little twenty five bits and some people is making back a grand on one ounce in tobacco. Selling tobacco is that his drugs? Crazy. I had to dig up the yard because I couldn't keep them outside. I had loads of holders in this yard buried burying tobacco I'm like how am I even getting away with this like fucking hell but bro. it got me through Christmases and that you know yeah 
It's not like I was like buying loads of bits and pieces for myself. I was making sure them kids have got what they need mm -hmm. for Christmas and that, you know. How's your brother now? My brother, um, he, he, do you know what? He don't sell drugs or anything now. He's he's doing painting and decorating and stuff. Um, what I do want to say, he needs to maybe go and have a sit down and a little therapy session with someone and that, you know. Because I'd say he's been through a lot more than what I've been through. You know, he's, yeah. he's been, like like I said, he's been, he was shot five times. He's been stabbed five times. And he's still breathing somehow. Like he's fucking blessed. He's ble he walks with a little limp. But um maybe he needs to have a little sit down that with someone, man. Uh, he needs to reach out. Maybe I'm gonna reach out to him and just give him a little cuddle and be like, come, let's go together if anything, you know. Yeah, just have that conversation, man. Like being immune to it, like to that sort of trauma is is fucked up in the head. But it's it's just the way it is, man, to try and settle and try and not settle, but it just becomes normal, but then there is a stage like he'll probably get those stages, but he feels as if he can't talk to anyone and like That's yourself. It's, so it's probably best that you phone up and say, you know what, you fancy going a walk and just talking about everything you've been through yeah. because as soon as you talk about it, you start to heal from it, you which do, is the main thing away. because you suppress a lot of things. There's a lot of shit I'll go to the grave with, I'll never speak about, but there's some stuff that I, I will and, and I don't mind that. I've wrote stuff yeah. down in pieces of paper and set them in fire just to kind of put it out there in the universe yeah. as if I've told someone. That, that, there's a lot of stuff I, could, I I can get out, but there's a lot of stuff I've had yeah. to water down as well at the same time. Of course, There's man. stuff I'm not trying to unearth again, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, because I'm at a stage now where I'm comfortable with certain situation and me talking about some some situations, what have happened in the past, it could arise, start, arise mm -hmm. again. And that's something what I'm trying to prevent, you know? Yeah, because these people as well who've been killed, they've got sons. They've got sons, so I'm I'm still got that respect for people and that, you know? Yeah. Would you like any more kids? Do you know what? I'm going to make my daughter as happy as I can. And if something happens in the future with another kid coming mm -hmm. into my life, then I'll make it happen. But for now, I need to make sure she's got the best dad around her. Yeah. And I need to sort these pockets out again and that, you know? Yeah, but that all comes with time, brother. You can just keep... I'm not even rushing it. I'm yeah. not stressing it. And how long have you been out? Four or five months? I've been out five months. Oh, do you know what? Everyone's saying, Lou, oh, you must be enjoying your food since you've been out. <laughs> Guess what? I'm not enjoying my food. I'm still eating tins of tuna and mackerel mm -hmm. and noodles every day. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> oh, mate. That's what I had today before I come down here. I had mackerel on, I had mackerel on toast. Macro yeah. and toast, you know. Are you struggling with food and all that? Are you struggling to pay bills? Still struggling. Like it's free, I get 300 quid, uh, 320 quid a month from the Universal Credit and it absolutely killed me to actually have to go in the job centre and do this. Yeah. But if I'm going to have to do things right, I'm going to do it. So like, I'm spending nearly £160 on travel a month. Then I've got to buy my food. Mm -hmm. take my, I saw my daughter twice a week, so I spend money on her when I come down to Battersea and that. I usually run out of money a week before I'm meant to get it again. Yeah, you know? on the basics. But lucky enough, I can like I could phone one of my friends like, mate, you've got 50 quid there, I'm sorry to ask him. Oh, don't be silly. And, mm -hmm. they, and he'll give it to me. But I'm not going to stress too much because I know something good is going to come, you know. That's all you can do, brothers. Believe that. For somebody watching this, listen, people watch this and people reach out or for jobs, like, what kind of, if somebody had a, a job, what kind of work would you look for? Do you know what? I'm I'm not great with things, but if anyone needs their house removals or anything like that, mm -hmm. me picking something up from here to there, I, I can do that for you. Or my personal training qualification is going to be in two weeks. I would love to start getting my own clients. Yeah. If you're willing to come down to my boxing gym and take part in some workouts and that, I'd love it. And where is that? That's in Battersea. It's at Carney's community. Mm -hmm. So um, in the next few weeks, we're going to have some stuff going on down there. That's all you can do, brother. You're trying. Something's going to happen. You're Something trying, good's going to come in that, man. Do you know what I mean? Plus, you've got a story. Listen, people write books in that as well. The books get turned into films like the father and son kind of bank robbers and stuff like that. It's a tale that I put there's that in there. So people would... Listen, there's so many little comical moments yeah. in there as well. I've, I've, I've left so much out and stuff, but maybe for a later day and when that comes out, maybe we can both come on in. Anytime, brother. Anytime. What do you think talking about your story? It's great to get get it out there and that you know, and just I just want Pete. So I just want a lot of the youngsters to see this, and I want them to realize I miss my daughter so much, mm -hmm. miss my family so much. So, did you miss her because you're out now? See when you were in there, do you try and block it out? I was trying to like I used to have pictures on the wall 
of my daughter and I'd wake up and like even though she couldn't hear me every night I'd go to my window and say oh good night Hallie I love you even though she couldn't hear that I felt like she could feel it certain thing certain yeah. things and that that's making me a bit teary talking about her but I'll never good year the yeah. year's gonna start getting better for me where do you go for the future brother this year I'm still I'm gonna be building next year it's gonna doors are gonna start opening again for me you know yeah, for anybody watching that's maybe going through a struggle, that's maybe in gang life, like, what advice would you have for them? Listen, it's not the one. Every single one of my friends doing 33 year sentences in prison, they've all regretted what they've done. So please just think twice. Yeah. Listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm, I'm rooting for you. Just stay on the path, stay clean, stay true to you, and, and big things will happen. I appreciate it, man. God Thank bless you, you brother. Much. Cheers, man.